Welcome to the porch here on Firefall Talk Radio. I'm Richard Grund. This is where we get back to basics, the red letter basics, examining the Word of God, focusing on the Book of Acts Church, seeing how the early church served the Lord so that we can follow their example. We take a deeper look into their service to the kingdom of God because our desire has always been to find and restore the priesthood of the believer and regain the world-shaking influence that the book of Acts Church had. By digging deeper into Scripture, we find the church the Lord intended, not the one that man created. We believe the church age is not over. What happened in the upper room is as much for today as it was on the day of Pentecost. If you know that there's more to your spiritual walk with Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, and you want more, then join us on this journey as we get back to basics. If you have any questions, go to firefalltalkradio.com. Use the contact button, or you can email us at the porch, lowercase one word, at firefalltalkradio.com. If you want to support what we do on that website, on the main page, there are ways to do so at the bottom, multiple ways. If you have any questions, reach out to us. We'll be glad to answer them. We appreciate the support and encouragement from each and every one of you that do. And welcome to all of our listeners from the various streaming platforms. Make sure you subscribe to us wherever you listen. Thank you for being a part of The Porch. Newsletter went out recently. If you did not receive it, please let us know. Write us and we'll send it to you again. If you need prayer or you would like to pray for others in the porch community, just contact us. Go to the main page for firefalltalkradio.com. Use the contact button. We'll plug you in. Remember that we care about you. So if you have a need, let us know. Whatever we can do, we will. If we can't, we'll get the word out and see how we can help. We can be found on social media, Facebook, Instagram, uh, X, which you know used to be Twitter. It's the X Twitter. And um, there are links on the Firefall Talk Radio page for all of our social media platforms as well as every place you can hear us. If you're a part of our aerial support, as I've said each week now, please engage. The enemy's engaged, and it's been pretty interesting. Not in a good way, but it's interesting. We know that that we are in a season of warfare, and 2024 is going to take it to a whole nother level that we've never seen before. Asking for prayer as I did before, um, Firefall has equipment needs. If you'd like more information, let us know. Personal needs. If links have been created. I will um, create a private page and post it for anybody that is interested if you want to help, let us know. It's the end of the year. Some people are going to be looking for tax deductions. We start out with praise reports and prayer requests. As always, I praise him for my salvation. Without that, I have nothing. I don't have my family. I don't have my wife. I don't have my sons or any of that. I definitely don't have salvation and eternity with him. So I'm very thankful that he did that. His love, his grace, his mercy upon me is more than I ever thought I could have or even deserved. I'm thankful for that family I mentioned, his protection over each and every one of us, for this ministry that he allows me to work, for each and every one of you, I am thankful, for the dreams and the visions, for everything that he has shown and shared, and both excited and concerned but I praise him for doing that, for the healing virtues that he offers each and every one of us. I praise him for this ability to praise him, that I have hope, that I know him. I know the creator of the universe, and he knows me by name. That I am renewed in my spirit man, born again, name written in the Lamb's book of life, and that he's showing us that he's getting ready to return. The signs are there. Are we looking? Are we watching? Are we listening? Creation's groaning for the return of the king. My heart groans. What about you? For that coming kingdom in the new Jerusalem. Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Oh, we praise you, Lord, for that. We thank you. We thank you for being that, for being our Savior, for being our Lord, our Master, our Teacher, for everything. We praise you, Father, for the love that you've shown us by sending Yeshua to die for us, for the Holy Spirit that allows us to connect to the throne room so that we can pray, we can intercede, praying for the Israel and the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 122, verses 6 through 8. If you don't know this, mark it down. You should be praying. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls. Prosperity within your palaces, for the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, Peace be within you. For the return of the hostages, bring them home now. For the fatherless and the widows, the innocents, the martyrs, the victims of injustice, pray for them each and every day. For divine wholeness, health, and healing in me and my wife, my family, let's get back to our divine design. We live in a fallen world. Things have happened to us. Sometimes we did it to ourselves, but his grace is still amazing. And I pray for healing, for deliverance, restoration. If you're sick, pray, reach out for prayer, ask for prayer. Pray for protection. That Psalm 91 covering to be in full effect for each and every one of us for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to fill us, for the remnant, you know who you are, to wake up, to rise up, answer the call to action in whatever way, shape, or form that is. He will show you. For those that have been blessed to be a blessing, let other people know. We need to get this conduit of blessings flowing. Faith-filled prayers, I'm thankful that we can pray and stand together. Push back, send the enemy running. Pray for protection, covering, that this is a supernaturally active and dangerous time. The enemy knows it. It is responding accordingly. So must we. We must become more aggressive in prayer, in response, through love, through uh, salvation, through deliverance. And I don't mean focusing on deliverance as a ministry. I do not believe that deliverance is a ministry, is an aspect of Yeshua. If you're in ministry, you should be every part of him, not just one. That's why I refuse the title of deliverance minister and have always been somewhat offended by it. I am a Yeshua minister. I am a gospel minister. I am a kingdom of God minister. Praying for the blessings, the flow, so that we can operate efficiently in the calling Exposing the enemy, seeking the lost, helping the dying, setting the captives free. So, Father, thank you. Lord, thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you for this ability, for the technology, for all my brothers and sisters out there. I thank you for the, for the word, spoken, spiritual, living. Thank you. We praise you. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to join us. Have your way. Do whatever it is you want to do with each and every one of us. Speak to them as I'm speaking. Expand the word. Let it come alive inside of them so that they can live it and be living witnesses to you and all the world. So thank you. If you agree with me, say amen. These lessons are proprietary information, except where noted the information comes from outside sources. The combination of that information, the matter presented, is exclusive, cannot be repeated or used without permission. The date of this broadcast serves as the registered date of the following information. Okay, get those Bibles open. We have a lot of scripture to cover tonight. I don't know if I've, I will get through it all. We'll see how far we get. Um... And this message will bleed into next week with a culminating message for 2023. 
Psalm 62, verses 5 through 8 says, My soul, wait patiently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in Him. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Kingdom expectation. That's what we're talking about. The kingdom expectation correlates to trusting that He is as good as His Word. It begins and ends there. He is as good as his word, both spoken and written. If he said it, he means it. If he had it put down on paper, it's important. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6, starting verse 25. Red letter basics from Yeshua, from Adonai himself. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to your stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble." Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all those things will be added to you. See, expectation, kingdom expectation, is not only knowing that he's as good as his word, but that his word is good, that he will do what he says. The word will do what it says. Go with me, Matthew 7, starting verse 7. It's actually 7 through 11. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Ooh, lucky numbers. I'm just kidding. Um, they, the scripture is good, so we know those numbers are good. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Luke 11. little variation on it. It's basically the same message except for verse 13, 11, 9 through 13. Verse 13 says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? See, what you ask for must line up with his word, and it must be his best for you. You can't just say, well... I have a driver's license, so I'd like a Lamborghini. No, it doesn't work that way. There's a major problem in that kind of praying 
James says, you have not because you ask not, but when you do ask, you ask incorrectly for your own selfish desires. What he's saying is your needs, whatever the kingdom needs, whatever you need, whatever furthers the gospel, keep on asking and it'll be given to you. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking reverently and the door will be open to you. Don't bang on it. Don't demand. Remember who he is. For everyone who keeps on asking receives, and who keeps on seeking finds, and to him who keeps on knocking the door will be opened. Keep praying. Keep seeking. See, the gift from heaven is the Holy Spirit dwelling in us to connect us to him. That's where the power flows from. From. Not from you, not from somebody uh, laying hands on you, though it can do that. No, no, no. The power flows from him, and when it's coming from him, it's in decency and it's in order. It's not out of order. It doesn't bring attention to you. If it does, it's not him. Seek first his kingdom and the things of the kingdom. There's an expectation of his help when we turn to him. Kingdom expectation means what we desire. He will give us to further the kingdom. And why is that so special? Because the kingdom of God is a special, exclusive place that he has invited us to dwell in. Isn't that awesome? Have you never have you ever seen it that way before? This kingdom of God is an exclusive place that not everybody gets to dwell in, to come into, to exist in. Continuing Matthew 7, verse 13, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. Because the highway to perdition, to judgment, is is broad. And that gate is wide. And there are many that choose it because it's so easy. But the gateway to life, eternal life, into the kingdom is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. That thought's repeated in Luke 13, 24 through 27. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, as I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, You will begin to stand outside and knock, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. Where are you from? And then you'll begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There are two kingdoms. There are two gates, one into the kingdom of God and the other into the kingdom of darkness, two outcomes to a path. And both kingdoms have a spirit connected to it. The kingdom of God has his spirit, a Holy Spirit. The kingdom of darkness has a spirit of evil, a spirit that is inspired and propelled by Hasatan and the fallen. That's all there is, two kingdoms. And by the way, the kingdom of the world takes you into the kingdom of darkness. Proverbs 10.28, The hope of the righteous will be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. Proverbs 11.23, The desire of the righteous is only good. But the expectation of the wicked is wrath. Oh, I know. Nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody wants to talk about good and evil, uh, heaven and, you know, you call it hell, but lake of fire, judgment, eternal separation from God. Oh, that's not comfortable. That's not popular. 
And that's why so many people are so lost right now, even people sitting in pews somewhere and worshiping in congregations, but still living the sinful lives they've always lived. Sin is sin. Separate you from God, and if he gave a ruling, you must obey it. But we have a kingdom expectation of something better. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says expectation, which also we get the word expect, to expect whether in hope, in thought, or in fear. So an expectation can either be hopeful or fearful. Expectation means to look for, to wait for something, to look forward toward what will probably occur, whether in hope or dread. There's no middle ground. And hope is a gift of the Spirit, and that leads to kingdom expectation. I was thinking about this today, and I wound up convicting myself. I have an expression that sometimes I've used, and I will cease or attempt to because it's so ingrained for me. Well, you hope you, you you hope for the best, you pray for the best, but you prepare for the worst. Well, that's not that's not faith. That's that's not hope. If I'm preparing for the worst, then I don't believe. See, whatever he decides is the best, even if it's not what I want. Chew on that one for a little while. Sometimes we don't get what we want, but it was the best thing for us. So always hope for the best. Believe for the best. Believe that he's as good as his word. Psalm 31, verse 24. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. See, your heart in its natural form, and I don't mean the boom, 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 blood. No, I'm talking about your spiritual heart. Maybe it goes boom, boom, I don't know. But I do know this. He strengthens it. He makes it beat. He makes it beat. He makes the the blood flow. He makes the spiritual blood flow through you. He is your hope. You hope in the Lord. Maybe you don't believe it. Maybe you don't feel it. Maybe you don't feel hopeful right now. Well, this is what I'll tell you. Start reading these scriptures. Listen copy them down. Read them out loud to yourself until you do believe. Start finding praise and worship songs about hope. Remember, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, both written and living. Hebrews 11.1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And if you heard the C conference or you were at the last one we did, and I would love to be able to do another one soon. We'll see what the Lord does about that. But the revelation he gave me is there's no comma now, faith. No, it's now faith. Now faith. That's what I have. I have now faith because that is the substance. It's the tangible thing that I have hoped for. It's the evidence of the thing I cannot see. I can't see the air, but I can breathe it. I can't see gravity, but I know it holds me down. I can't see the king on the throne room. Well, actually I can, but we can't. Most people can't. But I believe he's there. I know he's there. I have kingdom expectation. And you know what that does? That produces a divinely inspired expectation of good, an expectation of blessings. Change your mindset, and you'll see a change in you. Luke 12, starting verse 42, red letters. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his master will make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he'll make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and to drink and to be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him, and at an hour when he's not aware 
and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed these things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. But for every one to whom much is given, from him much is required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. Luke twelve forty eight has always resonated me to everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required. We cannot be ungrateful. We cannot be selfish. We can't be spiritual brats. There are a lot of people that expect the Lord to do things, fully expect it. And I tell you, he, he will chastise you. I had an experience one time. My mother came down from New York. My mother had serious lung problems. She had lung disease. And she lived with us for a while, and she was in and out of the hospital and rehab. And this one particular time, she had an episode and went in the hospital, and we visited her, and I was actually in the restroom griping to the Lord. Lord, I prayed against this. I prayed that this wouldn't happen. And and then he cut me off very sternly and says, I don't do what you tell me to. Oh, cool. Yep, I, I'm sorry. See, I, I can have an expectation of good, but I have to believe that what he chooses is good, and there's a reason for his choice. To whom much is given, much is required, and that includes grace, and that's forgiveness. So the issue is, Who lives that we live life in a way that looks for and takes seriously the return of Yeshua, the return of the King. The King is coming. He's not coming as a, as a lamb. He's coming as a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming with justice in his hand and fire in his eyes. He's coming to set us free. He's coming to chastise and punish the enemy. And then he's going to give account. We're going to have to give an account for everything we've said, everything we've done, everything we've thought, and what we didn't do. I want to be that servant that he says, well done. First John 2.28, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You'll be standing in the presence of holiness, pure holiness, pure love. I don't want you to stand there with your head down, unwilling to make eye contact. I want you to be able to stand there and say, I did the best that I could, and I know you've forgiven me of those other things, and not be embarrassed to have confidence, kingdom expectation is always tied into the Lord's return. See, we've had scoffing teachers who chose to overlook events, even such as the creation and the flood. Well, the people of Noah's time did not believe in Noah's warning because they never experienced a flood. I love that T-shirt and that meme that says Noah was a conspiracy theorist until it began to rain. They forgot, as false teachers do, that God created the entire universe by his word. Something they've also not experienced or understood, but creation by his word. The world is sustained by his word. He holds everything together by his very presence, by who he is. And the world's judgment and destruction will come by his word, out of his mouth, will come the word. God, Hashem, Abba, whatever you want to call him, he's my dad. But see, I know this, he's in control. And no matter what happens to this world, he's in control. No matter what happens in my life, he's in control. Well, the opposite of hope is dread. 
See, we're either going to have hope at his appearance or dread. Dread is to fear greatly, to be an extreme apprehension of, like many people will dread death because they have no hope and expectation of where they're spending eternity. Dread is a reluctant to meet or experience something. Some people dread going to big parties. They should dread going into the darkness without God. Dread can be a respectful awe that overwhelms you to be in great fear, a terror or an apprehension as to something in the future. And folks, looking into 2024 and beyond, we should have a dread in the natural, but a hope in the spiritual. Kingdom expectation inspires us to action and readiness. That's what the porch is about all every week for since May of 2010 here on online and March uh, 2010 w- within a private uh, conference call community. It's always been about preparing you to be ready and to act. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. That means you should be acting upon what you hear, first within your life and then within your surroundings and the life around you. Just listening is worthless. You have to do something with this. First, you must apply it to your life. You can't change anybody's life. You can't do anything about anyone. You cannot punish the enemy's disobedience until your obedience is fulfilled. And I will tell you this, if you want to go up against the enemy and go toe-to-toe with the enemy, and there's any area of your life that is disobedience, they're going to eat your lunch. Get your life in order before you think you can help someone else. Acts chapter 3, starting verse 19 after Peter's spoken and they, the, the, their hearts have been touched and they say, what shall we do? What shall we do? Peter said, repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of Adonai, from the Lord, that he may send Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua, Hamashiach, who was preached to you before. Kingdom expectation inspires you to repent, to be converted, and to come into the presence of the Lord. You must make choices. I've never understood the mentality of, okay, I'll just sit here and receive everything, Lord. You just do everything. I don't have to do anything. I've got my ticket to heaven waiting for the train. No, that's not. And I actually heard somebody say that last part. I've got my ticket into heaven. I don't need to do anything. Well, true, you don't need to do anything to earn it, but you need to do something with it. You need to do something about it. And by the way, the person that said that, God didn't answer a prayer. He fell away. I have no idea what ever happened. Proverbs 14, starting verse 12. There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. Laughter can conceal a heavy heart, but when the laughter ends, the grief remains. Backsliders get what they deserve. Good people receive their reward. Only simpletons believe everything they're told. The prudent carefully considers their steps. And the wise are cautious and avoid danger. Fools plunge ahead with reckless confidence. Proverbs 16.25, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And only when it's too late does that deluded person discover that he's on the crowded highway to death. He's on that path to death and destruction. And clearly, the scriptural implication is not that he was tricked, 
but that he made a choice. He relied on his own earthly wisdom rather than turning humility in humility to God. Two ways. One leads to life and another leads to death. Thankfully, I was on that wrong road. I was on the path to death. I was on the path to destruction and the lake of fire. But he rescued me. He came and got me. Every time you hear the word path in, in Proverbs, it's a, it's a metaphor for life and conduct. Proverbs 2.13, from those who leave the path of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. Proverbs 2.20, so you may walk in the way of goodness and keep to the paths of righteousness. Proverbs 3.6, I like this one. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. In all your ways, in everything that you know, acknowledge and recognize him, and he will make your path straight and smooth, removing the obstacles that block your way. Psalm 91, the angels will lift your feet up so you don't even stub a toe, but that's when you're walking with him in righteousness and proper behavior. You can't run around and be a fool. You can't run around and do things that break his laws and break his heart and think that he's going to clear the path for you so you can enjoy it some more. That's not how he works. And and a person may persuade themselves that their besetting sin, their false religion, their selfish ways, they can fool themselves that it's okay. But if it's not God's way, it ends in death and damnation. And I know not a popular topic, but we should be concerned for our loved ones, for ourselves. Because there are a lot of people that don't realize they're on the wrong road. And backsliders are always satisfied with their ways. It's all good. Grace, grace. It's all grace. I'm covered. But you know what? We can't be satisfied until we're free from our own ways. I've done my own ways. I've I've had... Ishmael, which is God permissive, God's permissive will. I want Isaac. I want his perfect will. I'm at a point in my life that's all I want. I want his perfect will. Whatever glorifies him, whatever furthers the kingdom, whatever sets the captives free, whatever puts the spotlight on him and not on me. I remember. I remember the path I was on. I remember the darkness and the loneliness. That's why I have compassion for people that are in bondage. I'm no longer trying to punish the enemy for what he did to me. I'm trying to set the captives free because God loves them. And he wants them free. 2 Corinthians 5, starting verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Messiah, he or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus the Messiah and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's what we're doing. Reconciliation between a father and his children. Old things have passed away. If you are still dealing with old things, they haven't passed away. They're zombies that have come back to life and want to be fed, and something you've said or done or uh, been involved in has brought it back to life. If you're dealing with the same besetting sins, if you're dancing around with the same bondage that has always been there, the same thoughts, something's wrong. And we should have paid attention to the Word a little more than we have We should have paid attention to the judgments against Israel. Oh, everybody wants the blessings, but nobody wants the judgments. Nobody wants the correction. Nobody wants the example of, hey, maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we shouldn't worship these things. Jeremiah 6, verses 16 and 17, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old path." with a good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. 
But they said, and they being Israel, we will not walk in it. Also, I will set watchmen over you, saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. They said, we will not listen. He was warning them, stop at the crossroads, look around, see where you're going, ask for the old godly ways, ask for the old directions, and walk in it. Travel its path, and you'll find rest for your souls. But you reply, no, that's not the road we want. We want this road over here. Look at those lights. Look at all those pretty colors. I want to go that way. I don't want to go this narrow way where i got to watch where I walk, and, and, and I can't just run and dance and do what I want to do. The Nelson Study Bible says the old paths in this scripture probably refers to the Sinai Covenant and the book of Deuteronomy as Jeremiah the prophet's calling the people back to the former days of steadfast devotion. And the people obstinately refused to walk rightly and find rest, and they never did, did they? They also refused to listen to the alarming sound of the trumpet, denying that any danger existed. Folks, there's danger, and it's coming. Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. The seeds you plant is the crop you get. Let me say that again. The seeds that you plant are the crops, are the flowers that you get. If you planted weeds, you get weeds. And he didn't plant those weeds. And you may be required to pull them up. You can ask for help. Been there, done that. But understand, you planted them. You're going to reap them. So entering through the narrow gate refers obviously to the decision following Yeshua as Messiah, as Lord and Savior, as living your life as though he is Lord and Savior. The wide gate, that broad highway, refers to the decision not to follow Yeshua and his teachings. Proverbs twelve twenty eight, In the ways of righteousness is life. And in its pathway, there is no death. I'm on a highway, a pathway, a path that's taking me eventually home into paradise with the Lord, with those that I love. I know so many who are not, so many people that I care deeply for that are not or who have already lived their lives and left and are in the outer darkness waiting judgment. There is no hope for them. They can't buy their way out. Nobody can buy their way out if they left this world without Yeshua as their Messiah. When they stand before the great white throne, they will be judged according to the law and according to their works. And the outcome is not good. You know, even though the Bible doesn't give us a specific date for Messiah's return, we, we understand the conditions. We understand the signs of what it'll be like at that time. I believe the signs are there. I'm not saying it's tomorrow. I don't know that it's not. would be great, wouldn't it? But we know that it's soon. Matthew 24, starting verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. It did not know until the flood came and took them all away. 
so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Message is repeated in Luke 17, starting verse 26. Please listen. The days of Noah were a horrible, horrible time, for as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all which we know historically because they have found it. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. That term, the days of Noah, is a warning label of a time, of a time where sin and debauchery and demonic manifestations are commonplace among the people that are given over to their base sinful desires. Sound familiar? Their rejection of an almighty God and a call to live according to his rule and his ways and his word have set their destruction in motion. Doesn't mean they're beyond redemption. If they're reprobate, like in Romans 1, then there's nothing that can be done for them. But if there's still hope, bring them hope. Bring them the word. Set the captives free. Because we should understand that in those days— The earth was filled with an evil that we can't even imagine that will be here again. The fallen angels, their demonic hybrid offspring known as the Nephilim. I believe that world will be a living hell. I've seen dreams and visions of what it will be like. Anyone who says the church is still here not only does not know what they're talking about, does not understand you don't want to be here. But yet in the midst of it all, there was still hope. Mankind was given hope by a loving Heavenly Father through a man untouched and untainted by the sins of that day. And Noah's blood were given another chance. When judgment fell on Sodom and Gomorrah, the favor of Almighty God's relationship with Abraham allowed Lot and his family to escape the falling fire and brimstone. And angels were sent to guide them to safety. In a literal fulfillment of Psalm 91, verse 8, And they only saw with their eyes the reward of the wicked, but it, because it did not come near them. Noah's blood and Lot's favor are the shadows of the protection and favor from our personal relationship with Yeshua, with Jesus. Through being born again of the Holy Spirit by the blood of the Lamb, shed on a wooden cross that favor given to us. Through our names being written in his blood in the Lamb's book of life, we will not see the rain of fire that will befall all that evil, all of Satan's angels and their demonic offspring. No, 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 no matter how bad it seems. We have a kingdom expectation of hope. We also have hope in the fact that we're not victims, but victors in the war between light and darkness. Believers cannot be cannon fodder in a war between heaven and the the fallen angels. It's also why I don't believe we'll be here for so many other reasons. But we're not cannon fodder. We're not going to be left to suffer. Because Almighty God, our Abba, has fulfilled the promise. He has sent to us the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and it's still here. And we've been given a way to stand against the serpent and crush the authority, his his head. We've been given the ability to live and exist in a fallen world. The cross, the blood, still holds its power. Power, wonder-working power. 
See, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're not human. They're not through our flesh, but they're mighty through God's Holy Spirit to pull down strongholds and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and to destroy all the works of the devil. So as you see the darkness cover the earth and the deep darkness, the people don't despair. No. Arise and shine in the full confidence that greater is he who is in you than he who is against you and shine. Glorify him. Glow with him. Be a light on a hill. And hold on to the hope that before he takes us out of this world, we can be more than conquerors through he who loves us and died for us. That's kingdom expectation. Second Timothy 3 warns us of what these times will be like. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. Why? Why should you turn away? Because they're headed down the wrong path through the wrong gate. Do not think that he will not judge them. Do not think that some of these false teachers and preachers and televangelists, men and women, people that have exalted themselves and built their own kingdoms, don't think that they won't be judged, but also don't sit in judgment of them and enjoy and revel in their destruction. Keep your eyes on yourself. Be careful lest you stumble. You see, I have a kingdom expectation. That kingdom expectation is that faith will help me triumph in trouble. Romans 5 verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, we also glory in the tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Such hope in God's promises never disappoints because God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit inside of us who was given to us. Remember what he said in Luke eleven thirteen: of you then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Kingdom expectation comes from the Holy Spirit manifesting hope inside of us. If you have no hope right now, stir it up. Maybe you need to ask for the Holy Spirit to be inside of you. Some of you don't have it. Ask for it. Cry out for it. Pray, believe, receive. You cannot exist in this fallen world with what's coming or now is without the Holy Spirit inside of you manifesting hope, reminding you of his word, taking away the fear. I have hope because I can see in the dark, because I have a permanent nightlight, the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me. Psalm 42, verse 5, Why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Hope, kingdom, expectation. Hope that he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. 
the rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We'll be glad and rejoice in his salvation. We have expectation and the hope he will rescue us from the destruction decided by the world and those in it. We've chosen the right gate and the correct path. Second Peter 3.14 Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless because you have hope. You've chosen the right gate. You've chosen the right path. Now walk it. Live it. Live in the light. Get out of the darkness. If there's any darkness in your life, if there are any shadows in your life, Rebuke them. Turn the light on. Get in the Word. Because the day of the Lord is coming. Proverbs 23, verses 17 and 18. Do not let your hearts envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all day. For surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. Psalm 147, 11. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his mercy. But that day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will vanish with a mighty and thunderous roar, and the material elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and the works that are in it will be all burned up. And I saw somebody teach the other day about nuclear. No, no, no. All he has to do is slow down the atoms so they start colliding with one another and create an atomic blast. That's all he has to do. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you be in the meantime, in holy behavior, that is in a pattern of daily life that sets you apart as a believer in godliness, displaying profound reverence toward our awesome God, while you earnestly look for and await the coming of the day of God, for on this day the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the material elements will melt with an intense heat. But in accordance with his promise, we expectantly await new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's kingdom expectation. Father, Abba, Papa, Daddy, thank you for saving us. Thank you for sending Yeshua so we would have hope. That we would not be separated from you from all for all eternity. That we can dwell in the kingdom. That we can walk in the kingdom. We can live in the kingdom forever and ever. Thank you for loving us so much. You made a way where there was no way. You didn't just judge us and condemn us. You gave us a way out, just like you did in the days of Noah. You gave him an ark, Noah and his family and all the animals you saved, all the creatures you saved. But there won't be an ark, because Yeshua has come and given us a way to escape the wrath that is to come. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for, Lord, the blood the cross, the empty tomb, the upper room, the Holy Spirit. Thank you for this word. Thank you for our ability to understand, to be able to repent and say, hey, I'm sorry, I messed up, and let you lift us up and dust us off. And Holy Spirit walks with us and says, hey, come on, we can do this together. Thank you. Thank you for a love I don't understand. Thank you for grace. Thank you for everything. Bless my brothers and sisters, Lord. Open their eyes, open their hearts. Fill them with your spirit. Let them be beacons in the darkness to guide the people to you. And I pray all these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord, may Adonai make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. May Adonai, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, give you shalom. I'm Richard Grund. This has been The Porch on Firefall Talk Radio.